Hey guys, welcome back. So today is wiring day. Yes, we are ready to wire the track and uh, hopefully get some trains running on this thing. So uh, we got to do a couple things first. We got to like wire the actual track itself. So we'll talk about uh, the design we're going to use for that. We got to also incorporate our different uh, control systems into that. Uh, so we got the DCS control system for most of the engines I have uh, are made during the Lionel Corp template years, which were all DCS uh, PS2 and 3s. So we'll use that system for that, which includes the WIU for any uh, control if we want to use the apps too. Uh, we got to put in the Train Master Command Control System because there are two engines and only two engines ever made with TMCC, and they were made by Lionel. Uh, I have both of those engines, so uh, we need that also. Don't really have to worry about legacy or anything like that. There's never going to be any uh, standard age engines made in those, and there probably will never be ever any more made in TMCC either, for that matter. Uh, so for the most part, uh, this will cover everything we need. And then we also have to uh, take into account uh, conventional control, because there could be some engines that don't have any of these command systems in them, and we still want to be able to control them conventionally, whether it's on the transformer handle itself or through the... DCS remote. So we'll be setting it up sort of both ways so we have our options of whatever we want to do. And of course we have to do that across two loops because we have two separate loops on this layout and we have to be able to control both of them simultaneously. So we got some stuff to do. We got wiring and we got all our supplies we need. So we're just going to jump right into it and talk about the design, get it done, and then show you the final result. So let's get started. All right. So here's a picture of our track plan. And uh, what we're doing is we're going to use the star wiring pattern, which is recommended by the DCS companion manual. If you don't have that book, get it if you're doing DCS, because it has everything about DCS in there, even how it works, which was really interesting on some of the stuff I was reading. But uh, we're going to talk about what that pattern looks like. But uh, in our particular case, what we're going to do is we have these two loops. We got this outer loop, and then we have this inner loop right here, right? And uh, we're going to break them into two power blocks per loop. So each loop is going to be split in half, basically. So what I did is on the outer loop here, I, I have a lock on up here. And then I got a lock on like down here somewhere. And those are the feeds coming from the, the, the you know, transformer. And then along the way on this block somewhere, I have a insulator pin in the center rail there and like the center rail here. So what you've essentially done is you separated this into one power block and that into another power block. And then I did the same thing at the top here. I have a, like a lock on right here. And I think I have a lock on down here somewhere. And basically it's the same thing. There's some pins. I forget where they are exactly, but let's say they're here and here. Um, and then somewhere over here, I forget. But anyway. You, you're basically taking this whole section right up to here as one power block, and then this section up here is a separate power block. So why are we doing power blocks? Well, let's, let's talk about what a power block is and why you want to do it. So a couple of the reasons for power blocks is that one, uh, when you have like, a, let's just say, you have a transformer here and you are feeding your track, right? And if you just had, uh, let's just do a simple loop right here simple loop of track and we just feed it right here okay and we're feeding our track so we're sending 18 volts to the track right here uh, but but the, by the time it gets around the track you know and maybe all the way to the other side here maybe I'm down to 16 volts now instead right because you know due to just normal resistance through the track and everything else I'm losing um, my voltage, so I'm not I'm not keeping a constant steady voltage around the layout, and that's the point of the power blocks. If I separate this out into two blocks by putting an insulator pin here and here, now I got two halves. And from my transformer, if I didn't do that, right, I took my transformer and I went around to here, and then I went around to here, right. Now I'm sort of centering it between these two halves. And so this would always be 18 volts, and this will always be 18 volts, and so I'll have a constant 18 volts uh, going around my layout at all times. So that's the first reason for a power block. The second reason for a power block would be if you are 
trying to troubleshoot something. So let's do it the same way here. We got our loop here and we've split it right here with some insulator pins on the center rail and we're feeding this side, right? And we're feeding this side, right? And then we power on our system and it shorts and we got a short somewhere between the center and outer rails. So where on this whole layout are you gonna find that short? Well, who knows, right? You're just gonna have to start at one piece of track and keep working your way around until you find the short. However, if you have a power block like this, right? If you killed power to this side and you don't have the short anymore, that means the short is on this half of the layout or vice versa, right? And so you can easily identify which part of the layout has the problem. And if you think about it, if I had broken this into four power blocks instead, and I had that same problem, I'd be easily uh, be able to tell where the short was in any one of the blocks. And this has actually come up on this layout that I'm working on right here two times um, that I had a short uh, because of the track and the insulators on the center rail. And it actually saved me a ton of time because I was able to isolate half of the layout and just say, okay, that half is good. It's somewhere in this half and this is where my short is. It saved a huge amount of time. So power blocks, not just for uh, making sure that the power is uh, even across the whole track, but also great for troubleshooting. So just keep that in mind before you uh, decide not to do power blocks. All right, so let's talk about the pattern here, the star wiring pattern. So, you know, really what they want you to happen is underneath your layout, somewhere in the middle, you're gonna have this distribution block, right? And that's gonna be fed by the uh, TIU, right? Which feeds the, you know, the voltage and everything to your uh, distribution block. What they want you to do is basically have equidistant lengths uh, from your block out to your different parts of your track. Okay, so let's say I had three power blocks on, in my example here. So I would have two feeds coming out, right? Equidistance as much as possible um, to the different parts of the track. So what is that gonna do? Well, if you think about it, right? Let's put our, just put a circle around here real quick. If this is going to different parts of the track right here, it's feeding, first of all, constant voltage to the different parts, so the voltage is always even going around the whole track. But really for the DCS system, it's all about the signal. So in the DCS system, the signal goes uh, out to, on the center rail to the uh, engine, and then the engine returns uh, a command or a bunch of packets back to the T, uh, remote uh, and the TIU through the outer rail. So Really what's happening is um, they want that signal to be sort of uh, strong enough and consistent across the whole layout. So if I just say, if I looked over here, like I suppose I had that same loop and I was just feeding it off the TIU right on this side of the track, right? By the time the signal gets all the way around here, it may not be as strong. I may lose some of the part of the packet and then it may not, the train may not react or I may lose control of the train or whatever it may be, right? So they want, basically what they want is a constant signal, strong signal going around the, the whole part of the track. And that's why if you use the star wiring pattern and it's feeding all these different pieces, you'll get that. The key is that you would have that insulator in the center rail here so that you're not sending a double signal to the engine, right? So it doesn't like double like blow the horn or the whistle, you know, if you use one of the soft keys, like the crossing signal or something like that. Uh, because uh, you're only, you know, depending where the train is on the track at the time, which one, which, you know, signal it's going to receive, because it's going to go out on all three of these. Um, now, there is another reason for this also, and that a lot of people don't uh, know about, which is everybody always thinks it's the center rail for DCS that sends the signal, you know, going to the train, and then you have the return signal on the outer rail right, going back to the TIU. But um, it also has a um, sort of a, a redundant system called differential signaling, uh, which actually transmits these signals on both rails. Uh, it's sort of a mirroring of the data packet itself. Um, so whichever way it's going at the time, right, like I said, the center rail, it's actually is on the outer rail mirroring it. Uh, and that's again, just to give increased uh, reliability and things like that um, 
to the different engines, uh, you know, that are on the track. So they can um, um, make those more easily identified by the engines themselves. And it's the same way when it's doing its return signal, you've got a sort of a, a mirroring happening on the center rail too. So by using this sort of star wiring pattern right here, you're getting a nice consistent signal across the entire track. And so one of the problems I have down on my old gauge layout when I tried to add DCS to it because I didn't do it this way is I don't have these uh, insulator pins on the center rails and what happens is it, it actually uh, double blows the horn or the whistle or whatever it is when I do one of the commands. I also, you know, on the farthest reach of my layout, in, it, I start losing signals to some of the engines sometimes and then I have to stop them and uh, reset everything. Uh, to get it back and that's just because again it's a weak signal by the time it gets out there because I'm not using this pattern so because we are using DCS on this layout and like if you use this pattern all the time on any layout no matter what you're running uh, you're kind of set right so even if you're not going to use DCS it's still a great pattern for uh, consistent voltage going around your entire layout uh, and the different signals so um, it's sort of like this is the one you use and everything else will work below it, right? As opposed to trying to get a, like what I did downstairs on my old gauge layout. Now I've got to sort of redo it to get the DCS system to work on it. Um, cause it's the, you know, more, more complicated and more finicky system. So, and that's what we're going to do. All right. So now that we got our basic concept down, how are we going to wire this? So. If we uh, look at our diagram right here, you can see I've got my Z4000 is right here. I've got handle one and handle two, and I've got, you know, of course, the hot and the common outputs coming out of those two handles. So first thing we're going to do is feed our TIU. Um, and so we've got four inputs on the TIU. You've got fixed one and variable one, fixed two and variable two. So basically what we're doing is we're feeding uh, two of the inputs with each handle. So uh, on the Z4000 here, I'm gonna take the power and bring it right down to fixed one and the common right down to fixed one and feed fixed one right off handle one on the Z4000. Then we're just gonna take jumper wires and we're gonna take those and go over to variable one to feed that. So handle one basically feeds both inputs fixed one and variable one and the reason we're doing that is because we're never going to have more these will never be used simultaneously off of one handle it's going to be one or the other depending what i'm running on the track and we're doing the same thing with the a second handle so we'll take our hot and common down to fixed two and then we're doing jumpers over to the variable two Okay, so that's feeding our inputs off of these handles. So whatever I set each of these handles to is what's gonna be coming into both inputs on the TIU. And then on the output of the TIU for those same things, before we hit the distribution blocks to the track, we're actually doing something in between there and we're putting these switches. So these are uh, double pole, double throw switches. And what this lets me do is uh, I can turn Whatever's coming out of the TIU, it doesn't matter. I can control it with the switch of what actually goes out to the track. And so what happens here is we're gonna take these feeds coming off of here and we're gonna put them on the, the center pole of the switch. So for the um, fixed and the variable that are coming out of here, they're gonna go down to these uh, switches and each one of those then is gonna feed one of the two positions of the switch that's gonna go out to the distribution block, okay? So this portion right here, the center part, is the part that gets connected to the distribution block itself. So each of these come out here and they go and they feed the two main posts of the distribution blocks. And that happens on both the switches, so not a great drawing, but you get the idea. They're feeding the distribution blocks that are feeding the track. Then what we do is we've got two pairs left on each switch. And so for switch number one here, we're gonna associate that with the handle one and fixed and variable one. And we're gonna take the fixed and we're gonna go down and hook it up to one post. And then the common would go to the other post. 
And then we do the same thing with the variable. The variable is going to come down to one post and then all the way over here to the other post, right? I know it's a little hard to see, but basically we're feeding the top and the bottom and when the switch is in the center position, nothing's going out to the track. When I flip it down, then it's getting the output from the variable uh, output of the TIU. When I flip it up, it's getting the output from the fixed uh, of the TIU. And then we'll do the same thing on the other side for the handle number two for the other loop. And then once it comes out of the switch itself, then it goes down to the distribution block. And then the distribution block feeds the two power blocks of each loop that we talked about earlier. And so what this will let me do is if I keep the handles on the Z4000, say at 18 volts, if I leave it in the up position, it'll be a straight 18 volts out to the track. And that would be, you know, normally command control engines. If I flip it to the down position, then there's zero volts going to the track because it's coming out of the variable output of the, of the TIU. And because it's coming out of the variable, now I actually have to pick up the remote, select the track, in this case track one, and then use the remote to increase or decrease the voltage on the track, which means I'm basically in conventional mode. Uh, so that would be the switch that I would mark as conventional up and then command down. Now, one thing you have to remember though is if I have the fixed going in and it's 18 volts, um, I technically could use the handle on the Z4000 and if I put a conventional engine on that particular uh, loop, it would actually still control it with the handle. So I actually get the best of both worlds. I can either use the variable output to control the conventional engines or I can, if I flip it up to the fixed position, which actually would be command, it would actually let me alter it with the uh, handle one and control it with the handle if I like it better. Like say I just like the precision of the transformer handle better to control conventional than the remote, then I could do that. So I have the option of doing it either way. The only thing you have to remember though is the fixed one input is what actually powers the TIU. All right, so if I'm using the handle number one there and I'm actually moving the voltage up and down, there's a chance I could actually make it so low that the TIU would either shut down or reboot itself, right? And then everything gets cut immediately when that happens. So in order to prevent that, what I'm doing is I'm actually using an external input, which is going to a little brick it's a Z750 I found up at Nicholas Smith. It was just on the used bin. But that external input is actually now what's going to be powering the TIU. So even if I move handle one all the way down to nothing, this TIU is still going to be powered. And if I have something running on the other loop under the um, fixed or variable outputs two, they would still work. Everything would still continue on as usual because I have a separate power supply actually powering the TIU. If I didn't have this piece, then I really couldn't use the handles to control it eventually uh, through fixed. I, I would have to uh, use the variable output to do that. But this gives me both options if I set it up this way. And that way, um, depending uh, what's happening, I can, I can you know use it both ways. Or maybe I have uh, there's somebody over running trains with me and I'm using the handle to control a conventional on the uh, first loop and then somebody else is using the remote to control the conventional on the second loop, right? Because the transformer is over here in the corner, you, you couldn't fit two people at the same time. So um, that's an option too. So by using this setup right here, I get a pretty wide range of options on how I can control either the command trains or the um, conventional trains. And it's all by a simple flip of the switch, which I'll show you. So I actually have this all finished. I've got everything wired up and I've already um, tested everything as far as the track, the voltage and the switches. And so let's take a look at the, what the wiring actually looks like in, in person and how I wired up these switches. And then we're ready to actually put an engine on the track and uh, give it a run and see what happens. Uh, just uh, quickly guys, I thought I'd just show you. These are the switches I'm using right here. Um, so these are, um, you know, 
heavy duty switches right here and there are they have three positions and so you can hear them click right and they hold each position um, and you can see it just has six terminals on the back here so the feeds going out to the track are the center terminals here that go out and then these are the feeds coming in from the inputs from the TIU and that's pretty much it alright so let's start with the TIU portion right here so as you can see um, I've got um, the feeds coming in right here from the transformer they come into the fixed voltage one and they just jumper over to the variable voltage and I'm doing the same thing for the common and it just jumps over and I said I do that for each of the inputs coming into the TIU and then on the outputs right here you can see they're all individually wired outputs coming out of each one of these and these are going to go over to those switches that I was talking about um, in my diagram all right, so here are my switches I have under, they're just right underneath the layout in the front here. These Mian uh, Benchwork uh, I-beams are nice, they have this nice thin, it's got to be maybe a quarter inch, right, that you can drill a hole through and then you can mount switches and things like that on here, which is actually what I did on this particular one. So the first one here you can see is track one outer loop and you can see if it's in the up position it's conventional and down it's command. And the same thing on this one, right? I just marked them inner and outer loop so I knew which ones they were and what, what track and handle they go with. And that's pretty much it. So let's look at the back of them. All right, so basically what we have here is the center post right here are going out to the distribution blocks to feed the tracks. And then each of these two wires on the bottom and the top part here just go back to those um, outputs of the TIU. And that's pretty much it. I did start using these little labels underneath the uh, the layout here. So these are actually electrical labels. Electricians use them. They're really cool. You can't tear them. They're not paper. They're made of sort of like this vinyl stuff, and they just uh, uh, you just like flip over a little adhesive strip, and then you close it on it, and it, it keeps them secure. And then you just write on them whatever you want. So I basically marked everything so I knew which set was what, which were fixed, which were the variable outputs coming into these switches. And I did the same thing underneath the layout over on the distribution block so I can keep track of pretty much everything that's going on underneath here. That way I don't have to worry about trying to trace wires back and everything. That's something I didn't do on my O-Gage layout, uh, which, you know, is always a pain when I have to trace something. So now I'm marking everything with these tags so I know what is what. All right, so there's my distribution block. So these are about under the center of the layout, one for each loop. And... You can see I'm marking them again, like what's feeding this. This is handle one feeding this, and this goes to the outer loop, right? And then, um, so each one of these goes to the lock-ons on the layout. And I did the same thing over here on this other distribution block. So pretty much pretty simple as far as that goes. And then these just, of course, go out to the actual lock-ons themselves. All right, so let's check this out. So handle one right here, I'm gonna put up to, um, 18 volts here and then same thing with handle two all right so we got 18 volts on uh, pretty much both of the uh, tracks right here okay and that's coming out and it's going to the tracks now if you look at the my lock-ons right here none of them are lit right now so that's the inner loop lock-on this is one of the outer loop lock-ons and neither are lit but if I go down to my switches I'll see that they're all in the off position all right so there's my outer loop switch you see it's in the off position if I put it down to the command position right here, if I actually go up, you can see I actually have my lock on lighted right now, right? What happens if I switch that around, right? So now I'm gonna switch it up to conventional mode. And if I switch it up to conventional mode and I go back out here, you can see my lock on doesn't have any power but that's because I haven't actually used the remote yet to do anything so I've actually power on the remote here and I actually go to track variable one is on the remote right here so I'm gonna pick that and then uh, if I actually turn it you can see I instantly got power to the track so I'm actually using this now to control the voltage to the track because I flipped that switch to conventional mode um, so again, I can switch between either or. Now if I switch it back to the, let me just switch it back to the command mode on that switch. 
okay? You saw it flip there for a second. I'm at 18 volts right here. But I could technically use the handle and turn it way down to nothing, okay? But the rest of the TIU is still active. So if I look at this other lock on right here and I flip the uh, second switch to command, it still comes on because the TIU didn't die because I actually have that auxiliary power supply going out to the um, into the TIU, I should say, right? So even though fixed one is now at zero volts, um, I'm still supplying the TIU with power, which means I can still use the outputs and everything else still works on the other loop. So really, this works really well with these combination of switches, depending what I'm trying to do. And I just put them in the right position for each one, and that will give me, you know, what I want out of the system. So, so far, so good with everything. Um, so now all we need to do is actually give it a little test run and see what we can do here. We're going to do a command uh, engine, and then we'll put the trolley on here, which is a conventional, and we'll see um, if everything that I thought was going to work is going to work out. So let's, let's actually run a train. So this is it. We're going to have an actual trial run first on the layout. Alright guys, here we go. So, uh, I've got my transformer handles set to uh, 18 volts each. So we'll start with the uh, inner track here. You can see I've got voltage right there. My switch is set to um, command mode right now. So that means if I uh, start it up with my remote, the engine should start up. So I'll pick the engine off the list, hit start up, hear some sounds. And again, right now I'm just using the DCS remote. movement. First train to run on the new track.
So I hit the uh, direction button on the remote to trip the E unit on the uh, trolley. And I just hit it again, and now we're going to opposite. see this. Uh, it's hard to capture on the camera, but we got two trains running simultaneously here. Alright, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually use the remote handle to control the trolley. So, what I'm going to do is, is flip the switch so it's in the uh, command mode, which would give the trolley a full 18 volts. And then I'm going to use the, the transformer handle to control it instead of using the variable output as a remote. So let's jump over there. So I'm going to just pull this down, right, to like 12, 13 volts. And we're going to go down here, and on our outer loop, we're going to switch this to command instead of conventional. And you notice the trolley stops because it doesn't have quite enough voltage. And I'm going to hit the direction button, trip the E unit, and there we go. Now I'm actually controlling it with the handle up and down right here. And I find that like with the handle I get more precise control than out of the remote. It's as simple as that. button, trip the U unit, and then go back the other direction. So I'm not sure which I like better, but what we've done is we've proven that the switch works and we can get it either way that we want it. So I just trip the U unit. So I'm just using the direction button, obviously. And then I still have the other one running on the inner loop. Now arriving at the next station on track two, train number 170, the Patriot. And that's it guys. So yes, we have trains running now on the layout. So this actually works out really, really well. Um, these switches give me total control over whether I want to do command, conventional, and which conventional. Would, you, would I like to use the handle or do I want to use a remote on the DCS? So um, the only thing we got left is we got to hook up the uh, TMCC system to get those trains running on here. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll talk about that on the, uh, probably the next video where we will, uh, hook up that cable, the base, make sure the, uh, the trains run. And then what we'll do is, uh, we'll actually show you what I've got currently in my collection for standard gauge trains. So we'll get them all on the track and, uh, run them around and, uh, you get an idea of where I'm at right now. Hey guys, well I hope you enjoyed that video. I am super excited because trains were running today on the standard gauge layout. I had two trains running on both loops simultaneously. One I was running conventionally, one I was running in command mode, and so that's fantastic. So uh, what we're going to do on the next video is we're actually going to go through the different types of uh, uh, controls I have with both systems, both with the DCS uh, the TMCC system, which you didn't see today, and the conventional, and show you uh, the different ways that I can control all the different functions through the remote, the transformer, and also the TMCC remote uh, too, oh, and how I'm going to control TMCC through this remote. So we got two different remotes we can choose from for TMCC, or uh, we can run them conventionally. So uh, next video, we're going to go through all the control options I have 
on the system and we'll get a couple different engines on the layout but I was so excited to see that 9e running on the layout and the little trolley running around everything's working perfectly no electrical problems and uh, we're all set as far as the track goes I just got to get the switches wired up I don't have those wired up yet and then uh, get the TMCC system wired in here test that all out and uh, we'll have a final video on all the um, control systems and the uh, the track setup and that'll be it then we're ready to move on to buildings and you know scenery and lights and all that kind of stuff so uh, pretty exciting we're getting uh, pretty far along here so as always I uh, hope you enjoyed the video uh, subscribe like make any comments down below and I will see you guys next time peace guys